Okay, you see the title, but I've got to say it anyway, just for clarity's sake. Biden should step aside for 2024. And I'm putting aside more radical arguments here, such as, you know, we shouldn't even have a president, you know, that kind of stuff. This is going to be more about, like, electoral solutions or uh, the electoral pathway to policy. And I'm going to be operating under the assumption that there will still be a presidential race for 2024 and things won't get so chaotic that it'll be a Mad Max scenario. Even though I can't really rule that out as a possibility, I'm, I'm just going to assume that, you know, the American society and fabric has not just completely been shredded um, by that point, you know, by all the the cult-like craziness that's going around. So first, there's the obligatory spiel about why I think Biden is relatively weak. So this isn't just going to be about bashing Biden, but there's going to be a little bit of that. So I think America the Beautiful is in trouble, and this will be even more so if Biden doesn't step aside and let someone else run in 2024. This is again. This not is this is not just Biden bashing here. The simple fact is that contrary to what Democratic Party establishment leaders claim, people like Joe Biden alienate too many progressives and thereby suppress their own turnout. Rather than tap into what anti-war, non-corporate Democrats and Bernie supporters feel, people like Joe Biden will always, maybe I shouldn't say always, but mostly favor siding with Republican talking points and extremists. Now, I know what you're saying. He gave that whole speech where he was, you know, calling the Republican Party semi-fascist and all that. But if you look at his actual policies over the years, there's no question about it. Um, you know, he had plenty of militarization of the police through the crime bill. He supported the drug war. He even supported the Iraq war, unless I'm mistaken. And I, I know some people out there, they're going to be like, but, but, but he, he walked back his support for the Iraq war a little bit or, or something in this way. But did he really that much? I, I don't think so. I don't recall history being that way. And uh, I could get into why it seems Bernie's crowds are often tens or, you know, hundreds of thousands of people <laughs> um, while B Biden's got only a few hundred, but that talking point is way too Trumpian for me. I don't really care to talk about crowd size as much because that shows a possible personality cult, and I'm not about that. What I care about is that there are some radical grassroots at the base of not the party, but the country. You know, uh, there's still some tendency to uh, say, hey, let, let's, you know, run the economy more democratically. Let's not have everything uh, being managed by, you know, the billionaires and e even the millionaires to some extent, you know. And by radical, I also mean, you know, people who want things like universal health care you know, the extremist and wacky concepts like that. These things, you know, they, they keep getting blocked by our faulty system. But honestly, I think there is the potential for some practical change in the coming years. So Bernie Sanders said recently, quote, I don't think it's debatable, end quote, regarding whether or not Joe Manchin has sabotaged Joe Biden's agenda. And, and I agree. Ironically, you know, I, I can say that Joe Biden has not been as bad of a president as I assumed he was going to be. Uh, obviously, if you've been following the news, you know, some of the things that he has passed recently that, that even have uh, boosted his approval ratings. So it's not like I have only bad things to say about Joe Biden. All right. So I'm, I'm trying to be fair here. So while I, I really like the idea of Joe Biden being the president rather than Trump getting a second term, I still think Biden's got to go 
2024. And actually, he seems ready to let someone else take the helm in that election anyway. I, I've, I've, I've seen, you know, some people posting videos saying he's planning to let somebody else run. And I think that would be a good idea. And I, I hate to sound ageist here, but let's face it, he's, he's going to be like ancient. You know, it's, it's the same critique that people understandably made about Bernie Sanders too. You know, he's, he's an old dude and, uh, older people, they, uh, they tend to have some issues that younger people don't. I mean, let's face it. That's the reality. In fact, he even recently said that he originally did not even plan to run in the year 2020. Biden noted at the Democratic Governors Association reception, he said this, when I ran, I wasn't going to run for the presidency of the United States again, and I mean that sincerely. I was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and my son had just died, and I didn't even have any interest at all until I saw those folks coming out of the fields in Charlottesville, Virginia, carrying torches, singing Nazi songs, reciting the same bitter, vile stuff as they carried Nazi flags accompanied by a white supremacist. And he's, he's noted that, you know, the woman was killed. He, he called her the woman. I, to, and to be fair, I'm pretty bad, bad with names too. So I, I, I think her name is Heather Hoyer. So I think that's the name of the person that was killed there. But anyway, uh, Biden continued. And when the last guy was asked, what do you think? He said, there are really fine people on both sides. And of, of, of course, you know, that, that, that's what Joe Biden said about why he ran, you know, all that time ago too. So he was really just reiterating this point. And th if that's the reason that he ran, then, Hey, that that's cool. That's good for him. But, you know, it's, I think it's time to let a fresh crop of people have a chance at becoming president. And I'll probably make a future video, or not video, but a episode of who I would want to run in 2024. But I'm kind of not doing that right at the second. So um, when Joe Biden does, you know, uh, I guess relinquish his seat as president, or of course, if he... Uh, just isn't there for whatever reason, you know, uh, that, that could happen too. The potential exists for a national progressive movement to grow up and become a formidable force against the robber barons out there. You know, the, uh, the wannabe corporate overlords who actually exist. That's not like some corporate conspiracy, uh, theory. It's like a corporate fact that's how the economy is. You know, you've got, <laughs> you've got these, these rich people who want to call all of the shots and hoard more and more wealth. And that's the reality. That's the way the system is. It's, it's not a crazy opinion. As a matter of fact, I think it's an incredibly realistic one. I mean, what, what do the Republicans have to garnish their fake populism with, you know, other than uh, praising the uh, mega corporations and all that kind of stuff. They've got gay bashing, anti-trans hysteria. They will mention the work of, or the word woke about 15 million times a day. They will give a steady diet, diet of smiley-faced neo-fascism, deeply unpopular total abortion bans, and and that's really about it, you know. And the smiley-faced neo-fascism thing. That's also very real. It's not, it's not a conspiracy theory. They're being incredibly open and honest about it. In fact, Tucker Carlson was, you know, giving white nationalist talking points um, th th throughout much of his show, you know, on Fox News, and he's still doing it. And you know, it's it's not really a secret anymore. And if there's one thing we should be looking for in the 2024 presidential race, it's not just a candidate with a certain amount of charisma, though that would be important, but someone who might be able to connect with millions of disillusioned voters through messaging, which is equally as important as, 
you know, the personality aspects. If you actually get people to understand policy and how it will affect them, that's really of vital importance. And of course, if you can get people to apply more critical thinking skills, that's a part of it too. I think in order to do that, you have to identify those voters early and then reach them with messages that resonate with them. And don't sound like you're speaking down to them or against them all the time, you know, and that would be another problem that uh, some of our politicians don't seem to understand either. Um, and, and keep in mind that these people are not like you or me, like we can trash talk the population in general and, you know, laugh and scoff at this person or that person or, or whatever. And that's all fine, but we're not running for public office. So if, if you are going to run for office, you, you kind of have to, uh, do a better job of messaging and obviously making your policy positions clear and hopefully not be too much of a flip-flopper, as the saying goes. And in addition to debunk debunking all of Trump's lies about voter fraud and whatnot, Democrats need to remember that things like voter registration and voter turnout are conditional. So the Democratic Party is not owed people's votes. They have to earn them. And that would require good messaging reminding people of what good progressive things have been accomplished and making it clear that campaign promises will not all be empty. The problem, however, is that Democratic Party leaders and pundits have actually made this very hard. In the past few weeks, months, and years, they've been arguing that the reason Bernie Sanders failed is that he was, you know, too far left, not centrist enough, and not enough like a corporate Democrat sellout. Well, that's, that's actually not what the polls are suggesting. The polls themselves tend to really demonstrate how progressive positions on issues are actually popular. And granted, it, it is politics and you do need a candidate with broad appeal. It's actually a lack of progressive policy wins that has damaged the Democratic Party's brand over the years. And like I said, it suppressed the turnout of more progressive voters. And sure enough, there are some who see that the extremist politics of the Trump cult are probably bad even for capitalism, especially over the long term. And I think there will be too much social instability, you know, under the potential guardianship of the MAGA movement. As I've done before, I'll quote Rebecca Henderson of the Harvard Business School, who said, I think the decline of democracy is a mortal threat to the legitimacy and health of capitalism. And I, I don't think she's wrong about that. I think even the conformists out there have reason to be concerned about far-right extremism. And by the way, when people like Bernie Sanders rail against what he called the greed and recklessness and illegal behavior of Wall Street, that was not just him being some extremist. It was really just him stating some facts. And that is the kind of stuff that people want to hear and what they need to hear. So that's why, you know, even people like Tucker Carlson with his fake populism, that's why they resonate with people to some degree. Because, you know, it sounds like they're saying stuff that challenges the sy system in some way. But of course, they're constantly, you know, doing these racist dog whistles in, in addition to that kind of talk and making it sound like people such as illegal immigrants somehow ha have the power over the economy when in reality they actually have less power than the average legal American citizen. You know, even Joe Sixpack has more power over the illegal immigrant, or you might say Jose six-pack, if you want to be a little bit crass about it. But, you know, it's it's just one of those lies that people like Tucker Carlson and, of, of course, all these other people are constantly trying to feed us. But again, this is not just about me heaping endless praise on Bernie Sanders and his messaging or anyone else. It's really about the issues and the ability to address them 
in some much needed ways, no matter who is saying the right words. And well, that's about all I have to say about this for now. I do believe I've said a few of these things before, um, but hopefully I kind of added a few new points in, and I, I really hope that people do take some of these ideas and run with them. Obviously, not a lot of people are going to hear this little podcast of mine, so I'm not saying that I, I'm going to be some great instigator for change, but I'm just hoping and uh, not praying, but something like it, the secular equivalent. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely hoping that, you know, people get smarter and uh, finally take things in a better direction.